happy to see you all here. Uh, we've been getting good turnouts here, and I really appreciate that. Appreciate you coming. My name is Vincent Rossi. I'm the coordinator of the Rancho Bernardo Historical Society Speaker Series. Uh, I always start off with a welcome and also with a uh, request to please uh, turn off or mute your iPhones, as I just did after getting reminded. Um, I also wanted to remind you about the Memorial Day, the Society's Memorial Day Pancake Festival, which will take place on May 29th from 8 a.m. to 11 at Webb Lake Park here in Rancho Bernardo. And we have uh, some flyers about that here if you want to look into that further, but please keep that in mind. I also want to remind you of our next program, which will be Saturday, June the 10th. Our speaker will be Javier Gonzalez Meeks, an assistant professor of history at San Diego Miramar College, who will be telling us about the Black Vaqueros of San Diego County. So please keep that in mind, mark that on your calendars. Our speaker today is Cindy Stankowski, the former executive director of the San Diego Archaeological Center. She's been affiliated with the center since 1996, and uh, they've done a lot of important work among which were uh, digs at the, in San Diego, downtown San Diego at Block 112, which is going to be the subject of our talk today, Block 112, The Untold Story of San Diego's Working Class in the 1880s. So without further ado, I'm happy to introduce Cindy Stankowski. Wow. Very nice to meet you all. Um, in case you're wondering, I started when I was 16. You know. <laughs> 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 I'm sticking to it. Um, this this um, presentation is really interesting to me because um, it, it, it focuses on some of the diversity that's always been in San Diego. Um, and, and we can tell by so many different clues, products that were used, even the cuts of um, when we find animal bone, how is it cut, how is it prepared? For example, Chinese butchers used a cleaver, whereas European butchers used a knife. So, it, and uh, different cuts of meat also indicate socioeconomic status. Um, so I hope that you'll find this interesting. If you have a burning question, go ahead and ask it, you know, just stop me. Okay. The urban I have a lot of information, so I'm going to have to read a little bit. <laughs> the urban development projects that took place during the building of Petco Park offered a unique opportunity to examine the lives of the working class in late Victorian San Diego. This is a group including ethnic minorities whose voice is hardly ever heard or misrepresented in the historical record. Their contribution to development of San Diego is often underappreciated. This archaeological collection provides a window into the lives of San Diego working class population during the 1880s. This small section of downtown San Diego reflected the same urban diversity that was typical of large eastern cities. Of the 50 residents, 16 were white or African American citizens. The other 34 were immigrants and ethnic minorities, including a Chinese laundryman, Mexican mill hand, a French gunsmith, a German day laborer, a Welsh mu musician, and a Japanese lunch man, and an Irish baker. The artifacts on Block 112 tell the story of an oftentimes misrepresented group in American history. The inner city working class survived the challenges of harsh living conditions, which lack the infrastructure that we can't take for granted today. In, search, in the search for prosperity, they settled into a new life on Block 12, on Block 112, yet they maintain vital connections with their own heritage. The story of the working class on Block 112 informs us not only about the history of San Diego, but also what it means to be an American. Where? 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 Block 112 was located between J and I Street, or what is now Island, and 6th and 7th Street in downtown San Diego. The 1888 um, Sanford map indicates that there were two Chinese laundries and a drawing yard, a wagon storage garage, a horse corral, a cigar factory, a general merchandise store, two restaurants, a shed for agricultural equipment, and new storefronts under construction. So here's J and I, 
and um, six and seven. And it's interesting to me that in this Sanborn map, they actually list some of the businesses um, that are there. The promise, the promise of growth resulting from a connection to the railroad attracted people from other states, as well as a wide variety of immigrants. In 1870, the population of San Diego was a mere 2,300. By 1886, it had risen to 12,000. A mere two years later, the population more than tripled, reaching 40,000. So San Diego grew fairly quickly. And San Diego was also one of the last places to get a railroad connection compared to other larger cities like San Francisco and LA. Okay. The sudden population boom led to the densely packed urban environment that is seen in Block 112. It was located just three blocks from the dark dockyards and a notorious Sting Reed district uh, with its disreputable established such as opium den saloons and brothels. So here's an opium den. You can see the pipe right there. Um, the, the bar doesn't look like a bad place. <laughs> I go. And, uh, and uh, a bunch of women were arrested in a stingery uh, raid. The, the second headline just gets to me, 136 promised to leave city, two agreed to reform. <laughs> so only two, you know. They're like, we're making good money here. <laughs> Most of the artifacts found in Block 12 came from Kirby's wells and trash pits. Before the city instituted trash pickup, which didn't happen until the 1920s, it was common to use old wells and privies to discard trash. The excavation of Block 112 revealed organic waste such as animal bones, shells, and seeds, as well as broken ceramics, scraps of metal, and opium tins. <laughs> so here you can see some of the material that's still embedded in this well. well. We do mask up and glove up. <coughs> Um, when we excavate a well like this, but pretty much the other matter that we're talking about is gone. <laughs> Although this practice of trash disposal was an invalu invaluable source of information for archaeologists, it created a public health crisis at the time. In addition, there was no true sewer system, which led to outbreaks of diseases like cholera, typhoid, and TB. Both Chinese and American med medicine bottles were recovered, suggesting that each culture was dealing with the effects of the unsanitary living conditions in their own ways. Despite their cultural differences, the inhabitants of Block 112 live very similar lives. The artifacts revealed that just like the people of today, these individuals were concerned with creating a safe, stable environment, forming a community, and finding economic prosperity. Understanding the lifestyle of the working class in the 1880s fills the gaps that are in the history book. And here we see quite a collection of items, um, including a, a Chinese uh, jar that was all, could be used for um, <coughs> wine or soy, and a, a Scottish ale bottle, the infamous Worcestershire sauce bottle. We always find a ton of those. Um, because if that refrigeration, you needed to put something on that meat before you had <laughs> it. Um, an ink bottle. Um, some various condiment, um, that's an ink bottle there too, uh, some various uh, condiment items as well. Just like today, there was quite a variety of cuisines available in San Diego in the Victorian period. The basic fare included beef, pork, and fowl raised in the area. In addition, there were quite a variety of fish and shellfish on the menu. So here we see some um, clams, um, oysters, scallops that you could actually eat. You know, you can't really do that anymore here. And here we have some um, uh, beef uh, bones. You don't usually find a lot of chicken bones because chickens lay eggs. So you only would eat them when they're not laying anymore, kind of old and icky. And now we consider chicken kind of a cheap dish, but back then it was, you know, chickens you wanted to keep around. However, there was no there was no refrigeration and condiments were your best friend when the meat was a wee bit off. One popular condiment was invented by eight, in 1837 by two London dispensing chemists. Its ingredients include vinegar, molasses, anchovies, tamarind, garlic, and cloves. Liam parents, right? And we find, these we find the bottle caps by the hundreds because they're very dense glass and they just don't erode, yeah. 
So um, we have quite a collection of these. They're kind of pretty when they're all together. The, um, the rainbow effect on the glass is actually caused by moisture. Over time, glass will accept a little bit of moisture, and it gives it that rainbow effect. Um, Roman glass especially has that. They have this blue kind of rainbowy, and if you actually touch Roman glass, it'll come off in your hands in little kind of flakes. Oh, there, there is an ad for the appearance. Okay. Japanese cuisine was present on Block 112. This little dish was made to hold side dishes such as pickled vegetables or steamed buns. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> it, it is typical um, merchant class tableware. The kamen, or these are kamens, or designs express general good luck wishes. Uh, number one is an open parasol and two closed parasols, meaning hat. A pair, number two is a pair of clothes and aromatic spice. Three is a fan. Four is a gold weight wishing wealth to the owner. Five is a lucky sack. Six is a turnip, which is an auspicious symbol. And gardenia is in, uh, alluding to good health. And uh, the Japanese Historical Society was very helpful in helping me um, interpret these little signs. How many people have heard of Blue Willow Plates? <laughs> well, they were actually conceived in Britain not in China, but and they, the design does include both <coughs> Chinese and Japanese motifs. And uh, it's, it's kind of a, a sad story, and it makes you think, you know, why would you eat off of this after hearing this? In the Blue Widow legend, the beautiful daughter of a powerful man fell in love with her father's secretary. Discovering their love, the father banished the secretary and constructed a great fence to keep his daughter contained. She could only walk by the water and the willows. She despaired until she received a message from her lover. <coughs> At a banquet, he rescued her, but her father noticed and chased them across the bridge. They got away, but years later, her father caught up with them. The secretary was killed, and the daughter died as well. In pity, the gods turned them both into dust so they could fly together forever. It's a pretty gruesome. <laughs> I like when you think about it. Um, I think uh, this particular one is a spode dish. All of the residents of San Diego enjoyed a tipple now and then. Here we see a Chinese rice wine crock, Scottish ginger beer bottles, imported wine bottles, and a pumpkin seed flask for that quick, quick nip, nip when you really were desperate for it. So they're called pumpkin seeds kind of because of the shape. And they're only about this big, you know, that, you know, think of it like a, um, what do you call them? Flats. Flats. Yeah, little flats. And we find tons and tons of these. They're ceramic, but the glaze makes them very, very hearty. And on the wine bottle, you can see that um, effect from the moisture. Usually, the um, the cheaper kinds of glass um, take on more moisture. <clears throat> In the days before antibiotics, patent medicines were all the rage. Many of these products were made by local chemists, but then became widely available. One item that was available to the residents was Dr. King's remedy for consumption, or TB. It contained chloroform, morphine, and pine tar, none of which would have really <coughs> anything to ease lung disease. Um, but, and I find that you know some of these were actually quite harmful. Hostetters. <laughs> Hostetters emerged on the market in 1853 and was sold as a medicinal tonic. He claimed that his secret formula of herbs forces off impure bile and purifies the system. He did not also mention that it contained 47% alcohol. <laughs> when, I love the advert, when hundreds of women endorsed Dr. Hostetters, there could be no doubt as to the cure. Well, yeah, you feel better after 47% alcohol. Um, you don't perceive immediate lasting benefit. It cures cramps, backache, dizziness, headache, costiveness, yeah, diarrhea, dyspepsia, and indigestion. So, <laughs> um, people in the 1880s um, suffered with numerous eye problems. Not only were there infection, infectious diseases causing problems, but homes were lit with whale oil 
lamps and heated with wood or charcoal, which caused chronic eye irritation. Um, even the widespread availability of reading materials, such as newspapers, were blamed for eye problems. Um, here we see some medications for eye care, and this little ceramic item here is it's smaller than a shot glass, and it's an eye cup. So you would put the medicine in there and then tip your head back to get that medicine in there. Um, and these cures mostly were water with maybe a little bit of herbs in them. Uh, but again, antibiotics hadn't really been investigated yet. <laughs> this one kind of creeps me out. <laughs> this product was put out by H.P. Wakeley, an early day San Francisco pharmacist. It was a cosmetic lotion that was advertised not only to cure sunburn, poison ivy, insect bites, and fre fre freckles, but also was recommended as a toothpaste. So you put it on your face so you can brush your teeth with it? I'm sorry. The directions advise that you apply cameline thoroughly by means of a toothbrush of medium hardness. Cameline is, is not only an excellent cleanser, but tends to prevent decay. And Camelina sativa is a, um, a flowering plant that's grown in Europe and Asia. And the oil uh, produced from the plant is still used in products today. But I don't know, those people look kind of creepy. <laughs> I don't know, I, yeah, we find a lot of these too. Some of these were sold in your local pharmacies, but also some were uh, sold by peddlers who came around with their wares. Oh, and here's the, uh, here's the little herb. And um, another one. This is what a woman might have had on her vanity table. A hand mirror, brush, a bone crochet hook, and a pot of Mason Doran face powder. And um, this was only, I did some research on this, and it was only made in Britain. So somebody had to have brought it over. It wasn't sold in the United States at all. And um, we've never really figured out what the mirror back was made out of. It, 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 it seems like it would have been plastic, but it doesn't, we just can't figure out what it was. It's kind of an odd um, bit of material. It obviously has metal inside as a support, and the, the glass, the mirror glass was gone. And the, um, the hairbrush and the crochet hook um, made out of bone. We also have found toothbrushes made out of bone. And some that have uh, bristles remaining, they are pig hair. Pig, you know, kitten. And I told this to a group of kids, we were talking about some of the objects, and one little boy asked, does it taste like bacon? <laughs> <laughs> well, you could hope, I guess. <laughs> so there, there we go, um, with the toothpaste. And this again was a toothpaste that was only available in Britain. And it's called cherry, but it doesn't have any flavor of cherry. It, it's actually colored with the eureka nut, the beetle nut which, you know, people chew in different countries and it causes their teeth to blacken. So again, why would you want that in a toothpaste? I'm not sure. And you said, you said that was only made in Britain? Yes. But somebody found that here? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So they brought their um, stuff with them. <laughs> um, Mrs. Graham called herself a doctor, but really was a purveyor of toiletries. Her most famous product was the Gray Hair Restorer. It contained alcohol, borax, glycerin, and red pepper. However, it did not contain sugar, lead, sulfur, or mercury, um, which, three of which are quite poisonous. So here is um, something to help you color your hair, but with the red pepper, I guess it gave you a tingle on the scalp. Maybe you thought something was going on, but it really wasn't. <laughs> Um, a little girl came up to me a couple of weeks ago and says, I really like your hair. And I said, well, thank you, dear. What do you like, the purple or the red? And she said, no, the white part. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, I came by that in my 30s, so thank you very much. <laughs> um, Colgate was founded in 1806 by a British gent, William Colgate, living in New York. They made soap and candles. In 1866, it branched out into perfumery. Colgate was famous for inventing the cashmere bouquet brand. You, you probably heard of it. In, in 1896, toothpaste became a hot commodity and they ceased with the perfume to focus on dental care. But here was um, the 
I, re I do remember Cashman was okay, and that's still, that scent is still in a couple modern day, old fashioned kind of perfumes, including Chanel number five, uh, Chanel number five which I still like. Florida water was invented in 1880 by a New York perfumer. It was alcohol scented with lavender and marketed for both men and women. It was very popular in barbershops as an aftershave, and it's still made today. I, I don't understand the little money <laughs> ever, ever, but um, tobacco is widely used by all ethnicities in San Diego. Here is a sample of the thousands of snuff bottles found in downtown San Diego. Women at the time complained that it was impossible to keep the hem of your dress from getting soiled whilst walking downtown. Smoking was practiced by both men and women, and this is a, a type of a clay pipe um, that was mass produced in Ireland, and you can just barely see the little harp motif on there. And we find these by the time. But th these little bottles, which are about six inches, had the powdered tobacco in it for snuff. And um, chewing snuff is really as bad as smoking um, tobacco. It caused a lot of um, mouth cancers, the teeth would fall out, you know, stuff like that. But it was addictive. Some luxury items were found on Block 112. A silver plated daguerreotype frame was made by Scoville Manufacturing of Waterbury, Connecticut. Um, 